Okay, let's go to the Kenyan capital, Nairobi, and speak to the security, security analyst and former U.S. Marine, Andrew Franklin. Andrew has lived in Kenya for almost 40 years. Andrew, thanks so much for your time. Uh, how strong is Al-Shabaab? How many fighters does it have? Just give us a summary about how it also finances itself. All right, Al-Shabaab has somewhere between 9,000 and 10,000 full-time fighters within Somalia. Its financing comes from a lot of uh, trade in, in sh sugar smuggling, the charcoal trade from uh, Somalia up to uh, the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Gulf, rather. Uh, it's also taxing businesses, including businesses in Mogadishu. Uh, in other words, it's uh, ra raising a great deal of revenue from within its sources in Somalia. It's, uh, it also gets fundraising from overseas through its Al-Qaeda uh, network as well. Uh, the uh, Al Shabaab has has is, is a manageable problem, but it has demonstrated an amazing amount of resilience. And within Somalia, it's now administering somewhere between 800,000 and, and 1 million uh, people. The, the anecdotal evidence indicates that people are now relying on Al Shabaab for justice, for a court system. They are in fact providing health care, medical care, and the like to uh, civilians under their control in many rural areas of Somalia. They control, a few, you know, they control towns and villages episodically, but by and large, Al-Shabaab has retained the tactical initiative to move anywhere it wants to go pretty much at any time within the borders of Somalia. And yet it has an international the attack presence. On, uh, the attack on, on, on Yes. No, go on, Andrew, go on. I'm sorry, the attack, the, you know, I was going to say, the, 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 the attack on Sunday at Lamu, you know, we're focusing on Camp Simba, the U.S., the three U.S. dead, two U.S. wounded, and the destruction of five or six uh, uh, American surveillance aircraft, which are, which are vital in, the, in tracking and surveilling al-Shabaab within Somalia, and, and complements the efforts from Djibouti uh, for the American air war which has been ramped up for the last two or three years with any number of drone strikes, fixed-wing airstrikes, which have not had any real effect on al-Shabaab's ability to launch attacks within Mogadishu on Amazon bases throughout the country, and also to levy taxes, if you will. What we saw on Sunday in Lamu was the first al-Shabaab attack on a Kenya Defense Forces base. It was, this was a deliberate attack on a permanent KDF base, which was established in the early 90s. Notionally, the KDF base is heavily secured, heavily guarded, especially since the United States began using it as a rendition site, as one of the black sites in post 9-11, in our post 9-11 war on terror, sometime around 2008-2009. The, uh, currently, you know, the Al-Shabaab attack on Sunday may in fact, or did in fact, come from camps that have been established within the borders of Kenya, including in Boney Forest, which does straddle the Kenya-Somalia border. But the fact is that Al-Shabaab has developed a homegrown franchise, recruiting non-ethnic Somalis into its ranks. For example, one year ago at Dusseta Hotel, the attack about a year ago, none of the five attackers, suicide attackers and people who were killed, were of ethnic Somali origin. They were all converts to Islam, but from other tribes within Kenya. Sure. Andrew, you raised so many points there. Let's break some of them down individually. First of all, the fixed-wing aircraft, the helicopters that were destroyed in that attack on Sunday in Lamu County. As you say, they're very important to tracking an al-Shabaab uh, is tracked very carefully. The Kenyan government admits that actually, with foreign technology, they can even identify lone wolf attackers. Do you think, with the destruction of that hardware, that Al-Shabaab may take advantage until that hardware is replaced? Oh, absolutely. I think that that goes without saying. There is currently a 60-day warning or, uh, of the air, airspace over Kenya was issued by the uh, Federal Aviation Administration of the United States. And that, it, it's all U.S. licensed or registered aircraft have been warned about potential terrorist attacks, potential problems within Kenyan airspace. Apparently, one of the aircraft significantly damaged on Sunday is the one that picked up all of the chatter, 
the, the, the mobile phones, the, the communications chatter back and forth that indicated that there was a problem coming between now and the end of February. Uh, I believe that we, we may very well see an al-Shabaab attack on the, the civilian air, airstrip on Manda Island. That is the airstrip that serves the a very key uh, tourist point of Lamu, Lamu Island. As far as uh, whether the United States has been sharing information with the Kenyans over the last three, four, five years with about al-Shabaab movements within Lamu County and elsewhere within Northeast County, I'm, I, would, I would only hope so. I'm not sure, however, that the Kenyans would listen. Uh, we've seen over the past few days uh, how the Americans have responded to the Iranian-backed militia Kataib Hezbollah and the killing of a U.S. contractor in the Middle East. And yet, here we are, a few days after that attack in Lamu County, and no response from the Americans. Are you surprised? I'm, I'm absolutely surprised. I mean, I uh, am dumbfounded. Uh, yes, I was, I'm a former Marine. I'm still a U.S. citizen. But I've, I, and I may not be a great fan of our global war on terror. The point is, however, watching World War III gear up in, between the United States and Iran because of a contractor who was only, who was killed and was just identified this morning, having three Americans killed and two seriously wounded seems, seems to would have, would have elicited some kind of major response from the United States government. But we haven't heard well, we really haven't heard anything. And I've, I've really, I guess it's based on my experience, but watching the pictures of the 23-year-old U.S. soldier who was one of the dead on Sunday, I said, I said to myself and to other uh, interested parties here in Nairobi, I wonder if he knew he was being assigned into a, into a country where there's a shooting war. Who knew? This is a very serious uh, escalation on the part of al-Shabaab, and I do not understand the silence on the part of the U.S. authorities. I would have expected by now that at least there would have been some verbal uh, uh, no notification, some verbal, I don't know, chest, chest thumping, if you will, because in fact, you know, and, and I don't think this is a positive development for Kenya, to have the United States air war extended into Lamu County. But I do find that the silence is, um, is, is bewildering to me. And I don't understand it at all. Not at all. What about the tactic of drone strikes? Can they work on their own? In 2017, the Americans said one drone strike alone killed about 100 al-Shabaab militants. And then the following year, they said another airstrike, an individual one killed about 60 militants. Can it work on its own? No, you see, actually, the drone strikes, uh, and I do some, I often question whether there are that many militants gathered in one location in time for a drone strike. Much of the, many of the drone strikes and airstrikes are basically on, on smaller groups or on individuals. These are targeted killings. The, uh, I think al-Shabaab is very careful not to gather large, large masses of troops in any area for any length of time. Uh, however, however, the, there were 20 to 30 attackers at Lamu who were able to mass and, and attack the, uh, a well-established Kenyan Navy base on a Sunday morning at 5.30 in the morning. The, who, they obviously knew their way around. They were able to penetrate the perimeter and to the, according to the government of Kenya, there, are no, uh, there were no Kenyan casualties uh, despite the ferocity of the al-Shabaab attack. Now, over the years, the United States has been ramping up its drone war, its air war against al-Shabaab in Somalia. And yet, al-Shabaab continues to expand its influence throughout rural areas. Uh, since the, uh, the Kenyan government invaded Somalia in, uh, on October 15, 2011, uh, any, any observer would say that we are much less secure today than we were eight years ago when the Kenyan troops crossed the border into Somalia. The, the ability now to recruit locally into a local Kenyan franchise is a, very, a rather disturbing uh, uh, development and uh, because it also indicates that perhaps the motivations of the recruits who are now joining al-Shabaab to fight within Kenya are actually focused on overthrowing the government in Nairobi. 
And so, uh, and, and so that's opened up the, uh, the area for many more recruits. The number of Al-Shabaab troops within, and I say troops, or fighters within Somalia has pretty much remained constant over the years between 9,000 and 10,000. Some, some estimates may put it as low as 8,000. But by and large, you know, that's probably as many uh, fighters as Al-Shabaab can equip can main and maintain at any given time. And that's more than enough for them to run their campaign to destabilize the federal government of Somalia yeah. in Mogadishu uh, and to continue occupying vast swathes of the rural area. One aspect of the drone war that we never want to talk about is after you kill people on the ground, do you have troops to come in to occupy that area, that ground that you have perhaps disrupted Al-Shabaab? Okay, you Andrew, if you don't mind, out of. I, the United States has... Yes. Andrew, if you don't mind, I'd just like to spend the last few minutes of this discussion getting the Kenyan political angle, but to hear uh, the professional security analysis is extremely interesting, but the politics of Kenya is just as important to this as any security issue. So I'm pleased to say we're uh, joined by Senator Ledama Olekina, who is senator, uh, an opposition senator for Narok County. Senator, thank you so much for your time. What's happening in Kenya right now that is helping Al-Shabaab recruit local ethnic Kenyans to their cause? This is not a Kenyan movement. It's a terror group in, of course, the neighboring country. I don't necessarily believe that there's anything in terms of the government policy that is encouraging the recruitment of Al-Shababs in Kenya. I think it's a personal choice. But to tell you the truth, um, that has actually gone down tremendously because of the policy of the government to try and ensure that they support the people, they rehabilitate the people, and they actually give them an opportunity to repent and to get corrected. The, the issue that we, say we, we have in this country is that w there is a conflict between two foreign nations. The, the fact that we are very good friends with the United States of America is what is uh, putting us in, in, uh, in a very uh, uh, hope, hopeless situation, whereby if you look at the recent attacks in Lamo, it was two foreign entities fighting, but because we are um, welcoming and we've been able to host the United States, who are great friends, we ended up being the, the victims here. No, absolutely. I was not suggesting there's so anything in government policy. So I don't necessarily believe that it is I, a I government policy. I wasn't suggesting there's anything in government policy that is pushing people towards al-Shabaab, just whether there might be a cultural or a social issue going on within Kenya. But how concerned should the government well, be that I, I, uh, there's been this attack on yeah. U.S. forces? Because that's extremely significant, the fact that it's the first time. Well, this is not the first time. And I think, you know, sometimes the problem with the media is that they blow out things out of proportion. Because when you think about the situation in the United States of America itself, I mean, there's so many terrorist activities happening in the country. There are a lot of shootings. Where we are as a small nation, Kenya, we, we, we border several different countries. The problem we have in terms of al-Shabaab is because of... Um, maybe uh, American foreign policy in terms of how they deal with terrorist groups. And also maybe the, there's an issue of the port of Kismayo, which the Al-Shabaab feel like it is part of their economic activity. And, and the fact that the Kenyan government has partnered with the United States government to be able to kick them out, um, they see that as us interfering with their economy. Now, when you come and discuss issues of social activities, it is a no-brainer. We have a very uh, uh, challenging period now. Our economy is not doing as good as it used to do. Uh, a lot of youth are unemployed. So, you know, you could be right by saying that some people might decide that that is the easiest way. But we, uh, as uh, politicians, are talking to our Kenyans and encouraging them to look at other alternatives of making a living because that is definitely not the right way of making a living. And we are encouraging our country, our president, despite the fact that I'm in the opposition, we are encouraging the country to be able to come up with uh, various economic activities and also social activities that can be able to support the youth. You know, at the moment, we have over 70% of the Kenyan population between the ages of 18 and 35. 
So when you have such a huge population of unemployed youth, of course, the issue of uh, survival uh, for the fetus come in. And uh, if okay. the, what is being offered by Al-Shabaab is lucrative, you'll find a lot of youth going there. Sure. Uh, Senator Ledama Olakina and Andrew Franklin, both of you from Nairobi, thank you so much for joining us on the Newsmakers. Appreciate your time.